Gospel according to St. John, and we're in session 19, still in John chapter 8. If you've looked at your notes there, you'll see that they're not so full tonight. Um, you know, when, once you get over the page onto the, the back side of the page there, there's only a couple of screens and they are quite short. Um, we have quite a bit, I want, I want to try and finish chapter 8, to be quite honest. There's quite a bit of, of narrative, there's quite a bit of conversation in it, and there will be sections of it that we're just more or less going to run straight through. But just, just to pick up where we left off at the last time around, um, I had said to you the last time around that this chapter, chapter 8, and by the way, there's notes if anybody you know, missed the notes and would want to get them, that's quite okay. But I said the last time that chapter 8 is a chapter that speaks about contrasts or speaks about opposites. Let me just give them to you again because these were on the notes the last night. The first section of the chapter deals with grace and law. The next section of the chapter deals with light and darkness. Then the next section of the chapter deals with life and death. Then the next section is freedom and bondage. And the final section of the chapter speaks of honour and dishonour. Those are on your notes the last night. It's just to give you uh, just an idea of, of where we were. We were we actually covered grace and law last time round, and we covered light and darkness as well. But before we move on for just a moment this evening, um, I want to say, first of all, that in this whole section in John chapter 8, you will find, I've given it to you there on your notes, you'll find that the word Father is used 21 times. So there's going to be a lot of debate uh, in the verses, you know, tonight that we're looking at where, where the word Father is mentioned. Jesus speaks about his Father and Jesus talks about their Father and so on. But, but just to, to recap on something that we touched on the last night. Remember we said about the woman taken in adultery. Um, we went back into the law in the book of Deuteronomy and a case could only be brought if it was at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Well, if you look at, look at verse 18 for a moment of chapter 8, because Jesus applies this same principle to himself because they, they would be very quick to pass judgment on him and what he does and so on. So in verse 18, Jesus says, I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. So there's two witnesses there that, that, that are mentioned for us uh, as well. Now, Jesus applies that truth to himself, to his ministry, and to what he is saying. And that's the verse, I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. Let's go back for just a moment into chapter 5, if you will, just to highlight a couple of verses that we, that we looked at back there whenever we were coming through the chapters. Chapter 5, let me read you verses 39 to 41. Chapter 5, verses 39 to 41. Jesus says, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. Verse 40, and you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive no honor from men. You see, the witness of the Father to the Lord Jesus Christ is found in the Word of God. It's found in the Old Testament Scriptures. Now, I know Jesus is performing miracles. He's, there's a witness there with him as well. His very works testify to the fact of who he is. But the witness of the Father, uh, and I know again that the Father has spoken at his baptism, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Throughout his ministry on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Lord speaks the same thing again. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. But the main bulk of the witness of the Father to the Lord Jesus Christ is found in the Old Testament. Their scriptures, the scriptures that these people um, are the custodians of, the scriptures that these people are the teachers of. The witness of God is found in those very scriptures that they are handling, that they claim to uphold. But you see, they fail to see the truth of what scripture said and was saying about him and about their Messiah. We'll touch on one or two of these things in just a moment or two. But let's go back into John chapter 8 there. We were back in chapter 5. Let's go into chapter 8. Look at verse 21. And down to, we're going to 
cover the next section, verse 21 to 30, because this is a section about life <coughs> and death. Life and death. Now, he had already spoken to them about leaving them in chapter 7, in the previous chapter. He said about he was going his way. But they had misunderstood as they also do here in this chapter. So look at verse 21 for a moment or two. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he saith, whither I go, you cannot come. Let me just give you a little note on that there. Suicide to the Jews was an abhorrent thing. It was something that they really frowned upon. And they, they, they were actually taught to honor, rightfully so, they were taught to honor all life. And so they say in this verse, is he going to kill himself? You see, if Jesus committed suicide, then as far as they were concerned, he would go to a place of judgment because of that. That's what they had been taught. And in their reasoning or in their thinking, that was why they couldn't follow him. Because they weren't going to be going to that place of judgment. You understand what I'm trying to say there? And that was why they felt they couldn't follow him. Now, we know, of course, that the opposite, exactly the opposite, was true. Exactly the opposite was what Jesus was speaking about. He was going to the Father, but because they were in sin and because they were filled with unbelief, and weren't prepared to change from sin, it was them who would end up in the place of judgment. But you see, they, they misunderstand, and they see the thing, as it were, sort of completely on his head. They would die in their sin. Jesus says to him, verse 21, I go my way, you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. And whither I go, you cannot come. Now look at verse 23 for a moment. And he said unto them, you are from beneath. In this verse we see two origins. He says, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. And you see, it's those two origins that determine two different destinations, if you like. Those origins determine destinations. Can I say, first of all, that the distance between Christ and and the ordinary man is as vast as the difference between heaven and earth. It's as simple as that. The lifestyle he lived, his capabilities and so on, although he was a man, of course he was God, but in, 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 in the man's side of his whole being, the life that he lived was so, so far removed from anything uh, or from anyone else in the world. But the thought is this, you can't end up above if you're not from above. That's interesting. You can't end up above if you're not from above. You see, that's what he said. You are from beneath. I am from above. You're of this world. I am not of this world. Verse 24, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. You see, the believer in Christ is given a heavenly citizenship. The believer in Christ, you know, John 3, we looked at it yesterday morning in church, except a man be born again. Another translation of that is born from above. So whenever a person puts their faith and puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, they're from above. The Spirit of God comes to dwell within and the believer has uh, you know, a heavenly citizenship. Okay, uh, go to Philippians chapter 3. I'm, a far, I'm too far ahead. No, I don't want, I have it. Now look, I've got Philippians verses 20 and 21. You see, uh, let's read verse 24 for just a moment. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Our affection and our attention are fixed heavenwards because we are born again. We are born from above. It's actually Philippians 3. Mark that in there. I've left the three out. Forgive me. Just look at Philippians 3. These are verses that we know. Um, but to just highlight this particular fact. 
if I can find it. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Last two verses of the chapter. The Apostle Paul writing says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our conversation is in heaven. We have a heavenly citizenship. And the truth here is, is of course, that the believer dies in the Lord because the believer lives in the Lord. The unbeliever dies in his or her sin because the unbeliever lives in his or her sin. And so the origin determines the destination. And you and I tonight, because we are saved, thank God we have that heavenly citizenship. We, we're not of this world either. A lot of people say we're spaced out, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. But we are not of this world either because we look, you know, we look for a heavenly, a heavenly uh, home that lies before us. So let, let, let me just comment. We're going, to, we're going to go through the following verses and let me just comment on the verses as we go along. Look at verse 25. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you in the beginning. Who are you? I'm exactly what I said. And he says, I give you, basically he's saying, I give you no new proof because you haven't honestly considered the witness that I've already given. Just you read your verses there. Verse 26 is another of those bold statements about him judging. And as far as they were concerned, only God could judge. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. I speak what I have heard of the Father who sent me. Um, still, still in verse 26, they can't even understand who he's speaking about, it seems, whenever we look at that. Remember verses, go back a minute or two, look at verses 18 and 19. He says, I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? And Jesus answered, You neither know him, sorry, you neither know me nor my Father. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. Verse 25, drop down there again. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? Jesus said unto them, even the same, I'm giving you no new proof. Verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Look at the next verse. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. So he, he, he's in this conversation with them, and, and their darkness seems to be so great, you know, that they just have no idea really you know, what, what, what he's all about or what, what he's saying, saying to them. They just don't understand. And let me just push that screen on for, for a moment or two. Because then in verse 28, Jesus comes to the cross. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. I think that's an amazing verse. Jesus talked, we know, about the cross many times before ever he went uh, you know, to be arrested and he went to the place of Golgotha. But there are some who would tell us today, listen, there are some even in the Christian church today who would tell us that Jesus came to this world, that he taught, that he was misunderstood, and he never really expected to end up on a cross. There are people who teach that. People who teach that. And I wonder where on earth they get that kind of rubbish from whenever you have verses as clear as this in your Bible. Where Jesus looks ahead. I mean, you'll find as you read the different Gospels, Jesus works amongst the people. He does the miracles that he does. He teaches the people. But there comes a set point in every Gospel where he comes to a set point in his, his ministry and his ministry changes direction from the world that he's ministering to to the disciples that he has called and chosen for himself. 
And you'll find that in every gospel. And whenever you get to that stage in those gospels, from that time on, he begins to speak to his own apostles more and more and more about the cross to prepare them for what's going to happen. See, he's leading them, uh, and we know this stuff, but he's, he's leading them. He's completely in charge of everything. Miracles are happening. He's, he's speaking, speaking. He's teaching with authority, with power. The Pharisees hate him. Everything's building against him. But he seems in complete control. And then the cross comes. And you see, he dies. And although he had taught them about the cross, and although he had told them about resurrection, not one of them fully believed that he would die and rise again. But he knows exactly what's up ahead. And so those people who teach us this other stuff, you know, I really just don't know how they can look at Scripture and take that, that kind of stuff out of it. Because Jesus knows exactly what's up ahead. And he's preparing people. So whenever they see it happen, they will know that he knew all about it. You see, remember, he's, he's in complete control. Isn't that right? He's in control of absolutely everything. So, so he spoke of the cross often. And he knew exactly why he had come and he knew exactly what lay ahead. And the term in verse 28, if you look at it there, then said Jesus unto him, when you have lifted up the Son of Man. That term lifted up, it has a dual meaning. Because it means lifted up in crucifixion, yes, speaking about the cross. But it also means, can mean lifted up in exaltation and lifted up in glorification. Okay? You see, the Lord Jesus, whenever he spoke about being lifted up, he often combined those two things. He combined the thought of the cross with the thought of what ha would happen when he would be lifted up after the cross. He combines all of that, that together. And you see, he saw his crucifixion in terms of <coughs> glory not in terms of suffering. Now, the suffering, yes, he would have to endure that. He would have to go through that. But Jesus continually looked beyond the cross. The Bible says, doesn't it, over in Hebrews 12, Hebrews 13, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He never stopped. His eyes were never fixed only upon the suffering. He was looking continually to what would lie ahead of the cross, what the cross would accomplish, and the lives of the people would be touched because of the cross. And so the crucifixion and the exaltation and the glorification, they all go together. And he sees the cross more in terms of glory than in terms of suffering. How do we know that? Look at chapter 12 for a moment or two. Chapter 12, verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Okay? Look at chapter 13. This time it's verses 30 and 31. Then having received the sop, he went immediately out. That's Judas Iscariot. And it was night. Verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Chapter 17, to his great, that great prayer that he prays, and it's verse 1 of that chapter. These words spake, Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. That's how he viewed the cross. He saw beyond the suffering. He saw the glory that would lie ahead. Now, Peter, uh, in his first epistle, we're going to go there, Peter uses the same combination, if you like. Go to one, First Peter, we're, we're just going to look at chapter 1. You'll find it's a train of thought that runs through Peter's first epistle, but suffice just to do chapter 1, just a couple of places that will highlight that. First Peter 1, look at verse 10. It says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, 
who prophesied of the grace that should come on to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. The two things go, go together. Drop down to verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There's the cross, okay? Verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him, there's the glory, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. And the combination of the two always go together. You see, the cross is a glorious thing, and we praise God for the sacrifice that our Lord Jesus Christ made. But the resurrection must accompany the cross to be of any worth as far as you and I are concerned. The sacrifice is made. The resurrection is proof that the sacrifice is accepted. Does that, you understand what I'm saying there? And so the glory, the sufferings and the glory go together. So it's his death, it's his burial, it's his resurrection, and it's his ascension that reveals him to the Jewish nation. Okay? And God has given witness to him in the pages of their Old Testament scriptures. But it's the whole process that proves him to the Jewish nation. Now, having said all of that to you, that's exactly what Peter presents to the Jewish nation on the day of Pentecost. So go to chapter 2 of Acts for a moment or two. Chapter 2 of the book of Acts. We're going to read from verses 22 down to 36. Verses 22 to 36. Let's just read it first of all. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Now, he has started his sermon. He's already been speaking to them, but we're cutting into that. Verse 22, he says, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus of Nazarene, as some translations put him, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held of it. For David speaks concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So that's what Peter preaches to them on the day 
of Pentecost. And I've, I've sort of split it up for you there because you'll find that in amongst those verses, Peter gives them four proofs of resurrection. Now, he starts with the cross. Look again at verse, verse 20, 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. That's the cross, okay? That's where Peter starts at. But he adds the resurrection and the ascension and the glorification to the cross because that's what the Old Testament scriptures has taught about Christ. You see, whenever we read down through those verses, verses 22 to 24, you see, he has spoken there about the person of Christ. Okay, he talks about the miracles and wonders that he did. And he talks about the <coughs> predetermined counsel of God. In other words, this was all part of God's plan. And the person of Jesus was, was, was a, a person of purity, a person of power a person of teaching, a person of blessing. And he touches stuff like that in that verse. And that's, that's the first proof. He says, how could death hold somebody like that? That's what he says. It's a proof of resurrection to them. Okay, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, verse 24, because it was not possible that he should be held of death. This type of person that he's speaking about. And then he goes into verse 25, and from that down to 31, he speaks of the prophecy of David. Uh, I've given them to you there, but go back for a moment and let's just read those. Psalm 16. Keep your finger in there, if you will. We're in Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. It's a psalm of David. And David says there, Psalm 16, verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices, my flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of peace, of life, I beg your pardon, thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now, Peter quotes from that psalm. Okay, talks about not leaving his flesh in corruption. And we read the verses together. Peter says, David's dead. His sepulchre is with us to this day. By the way, if, if you're ever in, in Jerusalem, they'll take you to see David's sepulchre. And if the guide's like our guide, before you take you in, the guide will say to you, this is not David's sepulchre because they don't know where it's at. But they have a, a place set up for that, and you have to go in and they tell you all this stuff and show it to you, but they're not completely sure where it's at. But obviously in those days, who those days they did. But the point being, he's saying, you know, how could David be speaking that about himself? Because he's dead. And his flesh has seen corruption because his sepulchre, he says, is with us to this day. Look at, look at Psalm um, what have I got verse 33 there for? Hold on. That, that's... Just hold, bear with me. Talk among yourselves there for a minute or two. How did it do that? Now. Mm. Let's see. I'm still looking. You just tear away there. Talk away a minute. I'm trying to catch up with my notes because I was speaking to you from the, from the screen there. Um, yes, sorry, yes. Go to Acts chapter 13, I beg your pardon. Acts, yeah, go to Acts chapter 13 for a moment. I have something missing in there too, forgive me for that. I'll, I'll tell you what that should be in a moment or two. Acts chapter 13. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. No, that's down at the bottom of your page there. Acts chapter 13. Now you have me. 
No, I tell you, listen, go to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, Psalm 33. <laughs> just, just bear with me one moment here. Bear with me. <laughs> Actually, I don't think that verse, that 33, that there actually, I think, is the beginning of the next line. <laughs> so go to Psalm 110. I'm going to be right this time. I, you will score that out. That's the beginning of the next line. Who did them notes? Was it you did them notes, girl? <laughs> no, forgive me. It'll all come together. You're all right. Don't worry. We're just lost for a moment or two. We're all right. Okay, Psalm 110, look at, look at verse 1 of it. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. <laughs> verse 2, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Look at verse 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy Youth, forgive me, you can score that verse 33 out there in, in those brackets. I don't even know how, how that got in there. But that's, that's speaking again. A psalm of David, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So in other words, the very prophecies of the Old Testament scriptures are speaking about the resurrection and they're also speaking about his ascension and they're speaking about his glorification. So that's that's the second proof of resurrection that Peter gives to them there on the day of Pentecost. Now go back to Acts chapter 2 and let's look at verse 33. This is where the 33 comes in. Forgive me for that. I'm sorry about that. Pray for me. <laughs> okay, Acts chapter 2 verse 33. In fact, yeah, let's go back into the chapter. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Okay? That's not the witness of believers. Sorry? 32. 32. Yes, verse 32. Yes, I beg. That should be... Ver Change that to 32 there. <laughs> what on earth has happened in there? Right. Okay. This Jesus has God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. That's the witness of the believers. That's the third proof. We'll get through this yet. Verse 33. Let's read it again. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou, that's where we read in Psalm 110, on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So Peter has given them four proofs of resurrection. And Thank you so much for your help to get me through that there. Appreciate, appreciate that very, very much indeed. But Peter, Peter has given them four proofs of resurrection. Okay, there's the character of Jesus himself. How could death hold him? Look at who he was. Look at what he did. And this is all according to the plan of God. That's the first one. The second one is the Old Testament scriptures, those prophecies of David coming from those two Psalms. The third one is, he says, we are witness to this. We have seen him. And verses 33 to 35 is the presence of the Holy Spirit whom he has sent. Let me say something that I said to you a long time ago whenever we were doing Bible studies on the Holy Spirit. Jesus says to them, it's in John's Gospel, Jesus says to him, whenever I go, he says, I'll send you another comforter whom the world cannot receive, but you'll receive him 
because he will be in you of a truth. That's what Jesus said to him. And you see, the very fact that the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost, I remember telling you this before, the very fact that the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost was proof that Jesus had got back home. You see, and I remember giving you this example, remember, I remember this bit so clearly. I remember saying to you on that occasion, if, if, if I was speaking to you and you needed some information and I said to you, tell you what I'll do, whenever I get back home, I'll send a letter to you with that information on it. If I said that to you, or if I said to you, look, whenever I get back home, I'll send you an email with that information on it. You would know that if the letter arrived with you, or if the email arrived with you, you would know that I had got back home. Isn't that right? So the fact that the Holy Spirit has been given, Jesus said he would send the Comforter. And the fact that the Holy Spirit has been given is proof on its own that he got back to where he said he would go to. Because he sent the Holy Spirit once he got back there, as he said he would do. You understand what I'm saying? You see, I might not send you the letter because I might forget, <laughs> or the email, or I might forget where to send it to, like the verses here, you know. But, but, but <laughs> all right, that's enough of that. <laughs> but, but, you know, that, that, that's the proof. That's the proof. He is ascended on high, and he has done it. We are witnesses. And, and your very, your Old Testament scriptures teach you that. And that's what Peter preached to them on the day of Pentecost. Can I show you a wee thing in there um, that I find interesting? <laughs> that's if I can show it to you. Maybe not be able to. <coughs> Look at verse 23. Jesus being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should behold, beholden of it. Now, pains of death, that can also be translated birth pains. Some translations talk about it being the horrors of death. Okay, but it can be translated birth pains. And here's the thought. Now, don't anybody go away from here and say that I said Jesus was born again because that's not what I'm saying. I understand that. But here's the thought. The tomb becomes the womb where the new thing of God comes forth out of, the resurrection body. You understand what I'm saying there? And he's loosed from the birth pains of death. He goes through death, he's in the tomb, you know, and it's like, it's like a womb situation where he comes forth, bursts forth in resurrection life, something completely new that this world had never seen before. I'm not saying he was born again, you understand that. Please don't go away and, and say that I said that. But that's, that, that, that's the thought that's behind that. You see, the crucifixion in verse 23, the crucifixion, Paul, Paul, Peter speaks to him here about the crime. You crucified him, he said. But he also speaks about the victory because death can't hold him. Okay, and then in verse 24, you have that word pain. And that, that's the thought behind it. Jesus bursts forth in resurrection glory. Now you go to Acts chapter 13 with me, if you will. Now that's Peter preaching. Okay, let's see what Paul has to say. And Paul's preaching to Jews, remember, as well. Acts chapter 13. Now, what do we see? Where am I? Verse 28. <coughs> Let me see, first of all, where Paul's preaching at. Look at verse 14 of chapter 13. But when they had parted from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. Now, let me make something very clear. That Antioch is not the same Antioch that's mentioned at the beginning of chapter 13. Different place, okay? 
just in case there's any confusion there. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. That's verse 1. They're sent out in their missionary journey. This is another place called Antioch. Verse 14, it's Antioch of Pisidia, and he goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So he's, he's going to be preaching here. <coughs> Excuse me, he's going to be preaching here to Jews. Now, let's cut into it. Verse 28, speaking about Jesus, and though they found no cause of death in him, Yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, that's the cross, they took him down from the tree and they laid him in the sepulchre. But God raised him from the dead and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that, he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he said also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That's he's referring to Psalm 16. Okay, that we've already touched on in Peter's sermon. And then he explains that again. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, he died, and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Verse 38, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. So Paul picks up on exactly the same reasoning. He picks up on exactly the same kind of thought. And he presents not just the cross, but he presents the scriptures that speak about his resurrection and speak about his ascension. Now, go to Psalm chapter, Psalm, Psalm not chapter, Psalm number two for a minute or two. Because Paul has touched on that Psalm as well. Everybody's still there. I think I've sort of collected my thoughts again. <laughs> we'll be all right. <laughs> Psalm two. Let's read the whole thing. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. See, that's their own scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. And that psalm is a messianic psalm. And basically broken down, First of all, verses 1 to 3, we see their efforts to cast off his reign. Why do the heathen rage? The people imagine a vain thing. Kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. There's efforts to cast off his reign. In verses 4 to 5, we see that they're, they're not going to be successful. No way. And God laughs at that. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. 
Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Okay, so, you know, they want to cast them off. They're rising up against God. They are not going to be successful. God looks at it and laughs as if to say, who do these people think they are? Okay, and then in verses 6 and 7, Messiah becomes king. Verse 6, Yet if I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possessions. That's the promises of David that Paul has mentioned there in Acts chapter 13. So you see, their own scriptures are full of that stuff. Full of that. And these are the teachers. And they're completely blind. And, you know, that, that's, that's what we're looking at here, basically, in this chapter. He died. He rose. He died. He rose. He ascended. He's glorified. And we see God's plan. And we see God's power in all of that. And to you and me, that's a great encouragement. Because in him, we died. And in him, we, have, we live in newness of life. We live in resurrection life. He had defeated death, and so have we. Do you remember what we looked at? In, go to Romans chapter 8. Remember what we looked at in Romans chapter 8? At the time we did God's eternal purpose, those of you who were here, let me just read you a few verses in there. Verses again that we'll know so well. Romans 8, verse 29. We're back on this subject again. <laughs> For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So God called us, okay? God justified us. I think I should be into my next screen. Yeah, okay, so God called us, God justified us, and God will glorify us with Christ in eternity. And that's what the scripture says. And we needn't look this one up because our time, our time's running away with us here. I've given you 1 Corinthians 15 and 49, and what that verse simply says, we have borne the image of the earthy, we will bear the image of the heavenly. It's as simple as that. Our citizenship is in heaven. We will bear the image of the heavenly. Now, very quickly, let's go back to, to cha chapter 8 of John again. Is that okay with everyone there? And forgive me for that and muddle up through the verses and stuff like that. I mean, notes were lousy and, and so on. But anyhow, John chapter 8, verse 29. Jesus makes two more statements. We'll run through this very quickly. Verse 29, he says, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Two statements. He is sent by the Father, and the Father is with him, because he always does what pleases the Father. Now look, there's all our stuff in there that we could get into. But suffice to say, thus far, we either receive grace, or we are condemned by the law. We either walk in the light, and have eternal life, or we walk in the darkness, and we experience eternal death. That's what the chapter has said to us up to this point. Now, the next, the next contrast that we see is in verses 31 to 37, and that's freedom and bondage. Look at verse 33 for just a moment, and then we'll backtrack. Verse 33, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed. You see that little word, they? I'm going to come back to that in just a moment or two. Go back into verse 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Okay, so there's faith happening amongst some of these people. Now remember, he's in the temple area. He has been teaching people, and leaders and rulers have brought the women, remember, caught in adultery and so on. So there's a mixed audience. 
that, that, that's in front of him here. As he speak these words, many believed in him. Verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay? In verses 31 and 32, he's speaking to those who believed on him. In verse 30. Okay, those verses go together. And he warns them that continuance in the word, discipleship, is proof of salvation. And here's the principle. As we continue in the word, we grow in spiritual knowledge and we grow in freedom from sin. The word of God has an effect on us like that. Okay, so that's verses 30, 31, and 32. Then in verse 33, the word they, okay, takes us back to the unbelieving Jewish leaders who have been questioning and arguing and opposing Jesus throughout this whole section. And who are they? Let's highlight that. Go back, look at verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Look at verse 19. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Okay, it's the same leaders again. Verse 22, Then said the Jews, it's the leaders of the Jews, Will he kill himself? And verse 25, Then said they unto him. So the they in verse 33 is referring back to those they. Oh, does that make sense to you? Okay, they're the leaders. They're the, they're the unbelievers. They're the ones who are challenging. Okay, uh, and that's, that's what that verse refers to. We need to remember that Jesus is speaking about spiritual freedom. They're thinking about political freedom. That's the difference, a natural freedom. And you see, whenever he speaks to them now in this section about freedom, they lie about their freedom. They lie about their freedom. And you see, they say we have never, we are Abraham's children. We've never been in bondage. I'm just paraphrasing the verses. But you will find if you search your Old Testament scriptures, they're lying about that because they have been in bondage many times. You go through the book of Judges and the nation of Israel were in bondage seven times in the book of Judges to different nations that God had allowed to overrun them because of sin. Seven times they're delivered from bondages like that in the book of Judges alone. And then we have the great captivity. We know that the, the two kingdoms, after they split up the northern kingdom with the ten tribes of Israel, they were carried ca captive into, by the Assyrians into Assyria. And the, the southern kingdom of, of, of Judah, uh, which was Benjamin and Judah, those two tribes eventually were carried for 70 years captive into Babylon. These people are so proud they can't even admit that to them. And yet that's, that's their history. And now... He's talking to them, and what's wrong with them? They're still in bondage because Rome, the Roman Empire, is ruling over them. But, you know, they're saying here, we're the seed of Abraham. We've always been free. Like, where do, where's their heads at? <laughs> Forgive me for putting it like that. But, but that, that's the way they are. And so in verses 34 to 35, Jesus explained that the difference between spiritual freedom and bondage is a matter of being a son and not a servant. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. You see, the servant is not a permanent member of the family. Now, you can take that two ways. You can take that two ways. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abides not in the house forever, but the Son abides forever. In other words, you could say, if you're just a servant, you're not a part of the family. But if you're a son, you abide in the family forever. You can take it another way. If you're the servant to, the, to sin, the Son can set you free from that sin. So there's two ways of looking at, 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 at that verse there. If the Son sets you free, he says, you are free indeed, or you're truly free. And the rest of this section then centers upon the word Father. You can read all of this for your own. We're going to run through it just very quickly. Um, Jesus identifies himself with the Father in heaven. 
He identifies them with the Father from hell. And then we have another whole section again about Abraham that runs from verse 37 down to verse 47. I know that you are Abraham's seed, Jesus said, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto him, if you were Abraham's children. Now, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something. Look at verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's seed. Okay? Look at verse 39 again. Jesus said unto him, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. You see, there's a difference between Abraham's seed and Abraham's children. Remember, Abraham had, had two sons. One was a son by the flesh. One was a son by the promise. Okay, so the, Jesus has drawn a distinction here between the two of them. Verse 40, But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, we, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto him, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? They can't understand, because it's not given to them to understand the word. That's what he's saying in that verse. Verse 44, You are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He is a liar. He's the father of lies. And, I, and because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? In other words, point out sin, Jesus says, in my life. And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not. Because you are not of God. You see, the worst bondage is the kind that a prisoner himself does not recognize. And that's exactly where they find themselves. These Jewish teachers and leaders thought that they were free, but in fact, they were in terrible spiritual bondage to sin and also to Satan. And so that, that's, that's that section. And your last screen there, very simply, is the last contrast that speaks of honor and, and, and dishonor. Running from verse 48 down to verse 59. The leaders could not refute Christ's statement, so they attack his person. That's a good way to do the thing. If you can't find fault with what somebody says, find fault with who they are themselves. Okay, now some commentators, look at verse 41 again for just a moment. Jesus said to them, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Some commentators believe that what they did in verse 41 was a slur upon Christ's birth and his character. Remember, Mary was pregnant but her and Joseph hadn't yet been married. And some commentators believe that that was a slur upon him because of, of, of the way he was born. But now look at verse 48, because they add to that. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that you are a Samaritan? What could be worse than, than calling them a Samaritan? We've already touched on all that in chapter 4. They hated the Samaritans. And not only do they call him a Samaritan, but they say to him, you're a Samaritan with a demon as well. You know, you, you can't get much worse than that. Sure, you can't like. That's, that's about as much as they, they, they could say <laughs> about all of that. Um, Jesus just simply replies to that. He says, look, he says, I honor my father. And he had warned them that they would die in their sin because of unbelief. Now in verse 51, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Jesus as good as invites them after telling them and warning them about their sin and unbelief, he as good as invites them here to trust his word. And he says, anyone who does that will never see death. You have another section now about Abraham. 
And Jesus says, Abraham rejoiced to see his day. And you know, their minds are all over the place. They are completely in darkness because they just are unable to see. And Abraham, of course, we know that Abraham saw his day. Well, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10 and verses 13 and 16. I don't think I've given you that. But if you want to write that in, that's how, how Abraham saw his day. Hebrews chapter 11. He saw it by faith. And then Jesus, towards the end of the chapter, Jesus drops this real bombshell. Verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. There's the bombshell. I am. A direct claim again to his deity. And the leaders recognized that. Tells us in that final verse that they wanted to stone him. But again, Jesus has the Father's protection. His hour has not yet arrived. And verse 59, it says, He hid himself and he went out of the temple, going through the midst of them. And so he passed by. And that's how the chapter ends, with all of those contrasts. What does the chapter teach us? I'm just going to throw this at you, and it's just, just a few lines. Let me just read it straight from the book here. Chapter teaches, the most difficult people to reach are those who don't realize their need. They are walking in darkness, not following the light of life. They are sharing a living death because of their bondage to sin. And in spite of their religious deeds, they are dishonoring the Father and the Son. That's what the chapter teaches us. And these are the people who crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, he called them children of the devil. And thank God tonight we're saved. Amen. And we have a heavenly Father, bless his holy name, and we have an eternal home. Father, we just thank you tonight. We praise you, Lord. There's so much, Lord, in there that we just haven't touched on, and we know that. And Lord, our prayer would be that anyone in the room who would again desire to go through that, Lord, we just pray that as they would glean, that you would just show them truth there, even all our truth, deeper truth than we've even uh, sought to touch on as we passed our way through it this evening. But Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. We thank you for the Old Testament scriptures that confirm everything about you, spoken about you hundreds of years before ever you graced this scene of time. And we rejoice tonight, Lord, indeed, that you died for us, that you rose again. Tonight you're ascended at the right hand of the Father on high, and you have given us of your Holy Spirit. So bless your word to our hearts, Lord, we pray. And Lord, we thank you for this time together, committing ourselves to you, ourselves to you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.